Hi, it's Dr. Ogden. In this lecture, we're going to continue our discussion of genetics, but look basically at what have we, what are some of the interesting things we've learned that go beyond Mendelian genetics. And so I've listed eight here, and we'll, we'll quickly go through each one of these. Uh, incomplete dominance, more than two alleles, codominance, uh, one a gene affecting more than one trait, more than one gene affecting one trait, genes interacting with the environment's genetic recombination and sex chromosomes. So incomplete dominance is an interesting phenomena where neither one of the genes is dominant to the other. A good example of this is in snapdragons or incarnations where you have the red and the white come together. So this is a pure breeding red and pure breeding white and we do that cross to get the hybrid the, in the F1 generation and we end up with pink flowers and it's the actual color pink. Uh, then you continue this to do the F2 generation cross and you end up with a 1 to 2 ratio both for the phenotype and for the genotype. So this is where both of these genes are being activated and when they're both activated the product is actually kind of an in-between product such as pink color is in between red and white. Codominance is similar but not the same. In codominance, both alleles are expressed in the phenotype, and both are being expressed, but the way that they're expressed individually makes it look like they're being mixed, as if, as if it was paint, like we just saw in incomplete dominance. But in codominance, a great example of this is Palomino horses. So when you have this dark chocolate colored horse and this light cream colored horse, and you bring them together and you get a Palomino horse, which is kind of this tan colored horse, right? Um, when you do the F2 generation now, you get the big R, big R, big R, little R's, and two of them, and little R, little R's. And so it looks like it is in complete dominance, but it's not. If you actually go in and look at the, hor the hairs on this horse, they are not tan colored hairs. It's actually still just dark colored chocolate hairs and light colored cream colored cream colored hairs, but they are mixed in such a way that to our eyes it appears to be tan colored. So both alleles are being produced. This also can be uh, demonstrated by looking at blood groups. So in blood groups we have um, codominance as well. So if you have, if you are blood group type A, that means that you produce antigens of type A, and so you cannot have antibodies of type A in the rest of the blood, in the liquid parts of the blood. And by the same token, if you are type B, you produce the proteins that, that produce the antigens. So you have the gene that produces the antigens on the outside of the red blood cell. So you cannot have anti-B antibodies present in the blood, you, but you can have anti-A. And if you are type AB, you produce both of these antigens on the outside of the red blood cell, and so you cannot have any of the antibodies. Type O doesn't produce any antigens, and so they can have anti-A and anti-B blood in their, um, in their blood serum. The next um, interesting thing that we've learned beyond Mendel is this idea called pleiotropy. Now a good way to look at this is actually with the characteristic of sickle cell disease. So pleiotropy though is the impact of one single gene but on multiple multiple characteristics. Okay, And sickle cell disease is a great example of this. So here are normal red blood cells. They have this dimpled appearance. Sickle cell red blood cells have this sickle shaped cell or even you know they start to have this odd shapes over here. So this is one gene, it's one mutation causing one change in a protein, but then the, the downstream phenotypic effects are multiple, where you get breakdown of red blood cells, clumping of cells, accumulation of cells in the spleen, anemia, heart failure, brain damage, spleen damage, and eventually paralysis, rheumatism, and kidney failure, and among many others. Kind of the opposite of this is polygenic inheritance, where you have many genes, poly meaning many, genic referring to the genes, many genes influencing one characteristic. So skin color is a good example of this, where if you look, if you counted up and somehow quantified the different skin color types in a, in a population, you might see this natural kind of bell curve shape. And this is because the more genes indicated here by the, each of these paired squares. So you have the here the very lightest of genes, three very light 
uh, all three different genes, the lightest form of each of those three different genes, and here the three different genes, the darkest forms of each of those three different genes. And so if you bring these together, your now Punnett square is going to be a 8 by 8 here. So you've got now 64 cells. And so if you, you know, bring those through, you actually end up with this more continuous looking character. So whenever a characteristic is determined by many genes, you typically have this, you know, normal curve um, representing the population. And that's because there are multiple genes involved in the expression of that one phenotypic characteristic. The environment, though, can also play a role in genetics. Now, one way of looking at this is at identical twins. So here's this picture I found uh, where this twin, Odo and Ewald, one was in, they're both track athletes. One, though, did much more of the throwing and, and uh, things that involve much more strength, whereas the other one was a runner. And so you can see that even though they're genetically identical, the phenotypes look quite different. And so just the, the way that, um, that uh, we interact with our environment can change the overall phenotypic look. You know, for example, if you end up eating a lot, you may have a bigger gut than maybe someone who doesn't eat as much. But also, it's important to realize that the environment can affect what genes are being turned on and what genes are being turned off. And a wonderful example of this is when a mother is carrying a, a baby, of course, you're not supposed to smoke or drink or take any drugs or things like this. And that's because it can alter the environment of the uterus. And by altering the environment of the uterus, it can, it can actually um, change which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off. And this, of course, can lead to birth defects and other things. So the environment does play a role in what the phenotyp, phenotype looks like. G genetic recombination is another complication beyond Mendel. Now, if we go back to pea plants, we can actually see this, where if you look at purple flowered or white flowered pea plants and you look at pollen grain length, so how long is a pollen? And if you go ahead and do the same experiments that were done before, you see that what the predicted, pheno, um, what the predicted numbers should have been based on a nine to three to three to one phenotype, or I'm sorry, a phenotypic ratio should have been 215 to 71 to 71 to 24. But the observed offspring were actually 284 to 21 to 21 to 55. So something's going on here. Did Mendel get it wrong? Well, Mendel didn't get it wrong. Turns out that when genes occur on the same chromosome, they sometimes get passed on as a unit. The whole chromosome gets passed on as a unit. And if that were the case, it would, it would be the 3 to 1 ratio. But sometimes things happen in between the genes where you have crossing over events. And so you get genetic recombination that occurs. And so you get crossing over that sometimes occurs and sometimes doesn't, right? If we look over here, if the two genes were really, really close to each other, then they would just be passed on as a unit. And you would expect the 3 to 1 ratio. If they're just enough apart to where crossing over occurs sometimes in between them, then you end up with these recombinant gametes, which give you that, those different numbers. And that explains the observations not matching the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. OK, so what number do you see in the middle? Number 7. Now, if you don't see a number 7, you probably already know this. You have red-green color blindness. Now, the reason I want to talk about this is because red-green colorblindness is one of these genes that occurs on the sex chromosomes, specifically the X chromosome. Um, it is not part of the Y chromosome. So a female carries two copies of Xs. So in this case, here's a female who is a carrier for colorblindness indicated by the white color on half of her body and the white color on this chromosome. The colored in red version is the normal version. So she is a carrier. A male who is normal, you can see, only carries an X. The Y chromosome does not contain the gene that, that produced the pigments in order to see uh, these different colors in our eyes. So when these come together, you see that you can get the X coming with the X, and you can get a normal female. You can get the X that is the, that is the mutant X 
with the X and you can get a carrier female but still able to see the number 7. You can get the normal X with the Y and you have a normal male or you can get the X that is color blindness with the Y and you have a male that is color blind. If you have the situation where you have a colorblind man and the woman is just a carrier, then you can get a female that is a carrier or a female that is colorblind. So if there's ever a, a case where you have a female that is colorblind, you know immediately that, the, that her father is also colorblind. It has to be that way. You can also get a male that is normal and a male that is colorblind. So this explains why we see colorblindness in a higher percentage in males because males do not have the other chromosome like right here that could be normal and could mask uh, you know the the mutant copy females have this so even though females can get a mutant copy they can get a normal one and so they can be normal so this is why you see males having a much higher rate of colorblindness than females